The only thing certain in life are death and taxes. And while taxes can be lowered, death is unavoidable. And in today's episode, we're gonna talk about preparations that you can make for a smooth transition of your estate long after you're gone. We get asked questions all the time about what's a will, what's a trust, do I need one? What's the estate tax? How do I avoid it? The situation can get quite complex pretty quickly. And today we're gonna coach you on everything you need to do to prepare for a smooth transition of your estate when you're not here anymore. Hi, I'm Brad, your retirement readiness coach, along with Matt Callahan, certified financial planner. And today we're gonna unpack the complexities of estate planning in a way that's easy to understand so you can help to lower the tax bill on your estate and prepare for a smooth transition long after you're gone. So Matt, we get asked this all the time. I know both of us do. And the, the common question is, what's a will? Yeah, people try to make this more complicated than it is. And, and I know it's a, a complicated subject, but basically a will is just a legal document that goes into place after you pass away. And it directs where your assets and if you have guardian or minor kids that need guardians, directs who, who's in charge of these things. Okay. And so the courts decide or they, they, um, they verify if it's appropriate and then they direct where your assets go. So a will essentially says what you want to have done with your stuff when you're not here. Right, right. And okay. one thing just to keep in mind, if you only have a, a will in place, that it has to go through the probate process. So that's, then the next question that comes in is, what's a living trust? And, it's, and then people go, and do I need one? Right. Can you unpack that a little bit? So a living trust is a, a legal document that you put into place again while you're living, and it can be revocable. So while you're living, you can make changes to it. Okay. The person that creates it is called the grantor. Okay. And so they put in place a trustee to manage this trust. And what it is, is it allows you to put all your assets into this legal entity to get it out of out of your estate and to be managed properly okay. by that trustee. And the grantor and the trustee are typically the same person. So you set up a trust, you essentially are the trustee, you're in control of your stuff while you're alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, and okay. so the main difference there between the will and the trust is that the will, or the will will go through the probate process and the trust does not. And it avoids um, having to go through that process that takes a long time okay. and can cost a lot. Okay, so one of the big benefits of the living trust is it avoids probate. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about why is that a big deal? Well, probate, like we just said, is very expensive um, and it can take a while to, to get your assets back to you. Right. So sometimes I've heard stories where probate can take over a year, maybe two years to go through. That's right. And so if you're if you're the um, executor of this or trying to pass out the assets, then people could be waiting for their dollars or maybe even having to come out of pocket to yeah. to get this process settled. Yeah. Although I'm sure there's some in, in the audience who are saying, I'm dead. What do I care at that <laughs> point in time? Exactly. Um, well, another thing to keep in mind then too with the, the will and the trust, and another main difference is the will, whenever it goes into place at, at your death, becomes public information so people can see what, what was in your, your estate. So if you want to keep things more private, the trust will actually keep, keep your things private. Okay, that's a good point. And the other interesting point you made was that a living trust while you're alive is revocable. So if you remarry or if there's changes to your situation, you can make adjustments. Mm -hmm. But then the, once you pass, then it's irrevocable. And so what does that do? It just ensures what the wishes are carried out for sure? Yeah, so typically there's a, um, a the trustee, like we said, or a successor trustee mm -hmm. and that grantor or the original person that wrote it mm -hmm. passed away, now it's irrevocable. That trustee is now managing the, the trust to make sure it's being distributed as the trust describes. Okay, so the wishes get carried out. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about estate tax. Kind of let the viewer, coach us on what is it? How does it work? So if your estate is too large, then you're going to owe taxes on that distribution or the, the estate will owe the taxes on it. It goes okay. up to, I think, 40%. And so currently the estate, our estate tax exemption is $13.61 million. Okay. 
And so, you know, you have to have a large estate before this is becoming an issue. Right. But what we need to just keep in mind, this number has changed, and I can only assume that that's going to come back down because um, everyone's silent business partner, uh, Uncle Sam, wants their, yeah. they want their tax dollars, right? Yeah, if you didn't know you have a business partner, now you know. Uncle Sam's your business partner. Um, okay, so a couple of interesting things. So $13.6 million, that's per person. per person. So someone can essentially die with over $27 million before the estate tax hits them. That's right. But there's a change to the law coming because the Tax Cuts and Job Act expires in 2026. And I believe that those numbers go back down to $5 million. Right, per person again. Right. Yeah. So, so still mm -hmm. a large estate. Mm -hmm. So you've just kind of walked us through the estate tax and also that estate tax exemption. If someone want, is concerned that they may have an estate tax uh, on their estate, what's, the, what's something that they can be doing now each year to help potentially lower that? Yeah, that's a great question. So maybe they need to look into gifting strategies while they're alive. And, and we find it more often than not that people want to give while they're alive anyway because they want to see the, the fruits of their label, or labor being um, utilized by their loved ones. So right. gifting strategies or using um, charitable remainder trusts of so giving away uh, life insurance, so permanent life insurance. This could be a time where it makes sense to cover the estate tax that may be due at that point. Okay. And so right now they can give up to $18,000 per year without having to file any forms, no paperwork, basically nobody knows. Right, well gift, gift splitting entails in, in, uh, in that way too. You can do 18000 per person. So if you're married filing jointly, you can give 36000 to each person. And then if they're married, you can give 36000 to one child and 36000 to their spouse. That's right. So you can essentially give a couple $72,000 without it ever counting against your lifetime exemption mm -hmm. and without anyone ever knowing. And the recipients don't pay taxes on that. That's right. Unfortunately, you don't get a deduction either <laughs> no, no, for making a contribution. Not that good. And then yeah. another thing, maybe uh, with the 529 plans, do you know you can front load those? How does that work? Walk so us through that. you're able to give to a 529 plan, so the 36000 if you're gift splitting, and you can do that times five. So that number, uh, 36000 times five, and put that in in, in one year wow. you, yeah, into a 529 plan. Wow, you can really front, you could load it, right, like you're right. saying. Okay. So back to the situation where we've got someone out there that wants to give money away to their kids, because we hear this a lot. Uh, I want to help my kid with a down payment on a house, or I want to I give them some money to help them get started, maybe start a business. What happens, so if, can someone give more than the $18,000 than the annual amount? I mean, is that legal? Is it allowed? Yeah, you, you can absolutely give more. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, it's the 18000 times two if you're gift splitting uh, to not fill out any tax forms, but you can go over and above that. Okay. And there's a lifetime gift tax exclusion as well, and that's the 13.61. Okay. That you can give, you just have to fill out the tax form and let them know, and that gets deducted. Form 709. 709. I remember right. from CFE class. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So that just gets deducted off of your lifetime exclusion. Okay. So in reality, you can give a lot of dollars away without any gift tax owed. Right. Um, but there could be tax forms involved. Okay. So you want to give, say, 200000 to your child to uh, use as a down payment on a house. You can absolutely do that. No tax to you, no tax to them. It just counts against that $13.6 million total lifetime amount. That's right. Okay. And if you want it to be more strategic and not have to worry about tax forms, maybe you give at the end of the year and then give at the beginning of the year, gift split on both. It's, ah. not, a, it's not a 12 month thing, it's per calendar year. So, so right. 18 per person. Okay, right. Yeah. You could quickly get them the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. So speaking of taxes, there's a lot of talk about the step up and cost basis and, and you know, maybe it's going to go away in the future, but as long as it's here, talk to us a little bit. What is the step up in basis and why is that so powerful? So let, let's keep it simple. Let's say you have a normal brokerage account and you put in a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. That hundred thousand is your basis. So the definition, what you put into it is your cost basis. If that account grew to a million dollars, and you held the account for a year and a day. You have long-term capital gains if you sell anything, right? And so that 900,000, if you, while you're alive, you sell any of those gains, you'll owe taxes on that. But let's say, long, long time from now, you, you pass away. Okay. And so your basis on date of death gets stepped up to that value. Say it's a million dollars on date of death. Whoever is the beneficiary of that account 
now has a basis of a million dollars and wow. can virtually sell everything in that account owing no tax. So the $900,000 of gains that was going to result in a big tax bill right. disappears. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other cool thing about that is uh, for a husband and wife, um, the when the first spouse passes, the survivor gets a step up. There's a, a, a first step up. And then if assets are structured properly, then when the second spouse passes, the estate gets another step up. That's right. So the kids can get everything tax-free. Right, right. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I've seen a landmine. I've seen people step on a landmine in the way that they title their accounts. When they put a kid on the account while mom or dad is alive, I've seen where that negates that second step up. Have you, have you ever seen situations like that? So, wait, so tell me more. Okay, so uh, you've got a dad passed away, and in the example you just gave, the cost basis is 100000 Mom now has a million dollars of securities, totally tax-free. Mom is worried about m mental capacity or what have you, and instead of using a power of attorney, mom actually puts little Johnny on the account as a, in joint tenants. So, so they're now they're now joint. So now the child mm. is now an owner uh, uh, with mom, and in situations like that, that negates the second step up in basis. That's right. Yeah, I've seen that mistake happen, and and the, the easy way to avoid that is use the living trust, mm -hmm. title the account in the name of the living trust, let um, let the child have a power of attorney so they can they can help with mom as, as mom ages but then it doesn't negate the second step up in basis. Right, so the trust would probably be number one thing to do on an account like that, as right. um, to label it in the name of the trust. Right. Worst case, if you're not looking to have a trust in place or don't have one in place yet, you can do what's called a uh, transfer on death, then that's a, ne a beneficiary on a, a non-retirement account. Okay, so you, now can, do you, is it limited to just one beneficiary or can you do you, multiple? You can name multiple beneficiaries as TO. Can you do contingents on those? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. So then when it comes to naming beneficiaries, you know, in the theme of estate planning and, and adding beneficiaries, walk us through kind of concepts or thoughts. How, how do you think about um, adding beneficiaries to accounts? So two things here. Uh, let's, we'll look at non-retirement accounts and retirement accounts. Okay. Uh, so let's start with retirement accounts. I prefer naming actual people on retirement accounts. Okay. They're tax sheltered vehicles. I'd rather see it be clean go. Typically we see the primaries being the opposite spouse okay. and contingents being the kids. Uh, let's say the kids aren't financially responsible yet. I still recommend doing contingent beneficiaries, but maybe that's the time where you could name a trust or a non-person okay. non uh, okay. for the beneficiary. Okay. On the non-retirement accounts, uh, the trust is okay. It's going to have that trustee that's going to direct where those assets are going to go. Okay. So, so set up your non-retirement accounts uh, in the name of your living trust, um, and then your retirement accounts name a person mm -hmm. as a beneficiary. Okay. Um, what's the, the problem that can arise if, if you, because I hear this, people go, well, should I name my trust as beneficiary to my IRA? It can be okay, yeah. uh, but just be aware that in the trust documents, it, there needs to be certain language, I believe it's conduit trust. Conduit, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sure all the attorneys write this in there and it's protocol now, but we have seen horror stories where yeah. it wasn't written correctly, right. and now this whole tax sheltered vehicle becomes fully taxable to the estate. Right. You just created one of those ticking tax time bombs that we talked about. Huge time bomb, mm -hmm. right. Okay, so if you're gonna name, so choice number one is name a person as the primary and contingent beneficiary. Beneficiaries. But in that example, I think you gave a great one where your child is just maybe not savvy with money or maybe has substance abuse issues or addiction, whatever, whatever it is. If you must name a trust, you've got to make sure that you have a good estate planner that has written documents that are that are current with modern law mm -hmm. that can that make sure it's a it's a conduit IRA trust to avoid the huge tax bomb. And have your attorneys, your CFPs, your CPAs all working together to make sure that the act, the full plan is working together. Right. Is there a time that you don't think that you should have a trust? Is it okay just to have a will in place? Great question. So it depends. Um, if, you're, if your estate is very small, and I think a good rule of thumb is around $150,000 or less, that might be a situation where that's gonna avoid probate. But if you have at least 150,000 in assets across everything that you own, um, ideally having a living trust is gonna be the smoothest way 
uh, to protect your assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more often than not, you're probably going to need that trust in place and keep your privacy and things like that. Absolutely. It's just a great way to be organized. Um, you know, while you may not be here anymore, um, the, 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 those that you love in your life will be really grateful that you, that you took the time to get organized um, before you passed. Let's say people already have their trust in place. What, when should they review? Was there, was there a year, something changed, or tell me more there. That's a good question, absolutely. If any trust that was created prior to 2010 is now outdated and that needs to be looked at immediately. And why I say that is there was a major change to the laws in 2010. Something new was introduced to the world of estate planning known as portability. Mm -hmm. So in the past, husband, wife, uh, typically us guys die first, so husband dies. And many of the trusts, if not all the trusts that were created prior to 2010 were known as AB trusts. There was a B for bypass and, and the A trust would have been the, the marital trust. Um, and so what that means is the first person dies, uh, you would take up to a million dollars because that used to be the estate tax exemption uh, back in the day. And you take a million dollars of assets and you'd put it in the bypass trust. And then any growth on that would be free from estate taxes in the future, although it did lose the step up in basis. Well, in 2010, they enacted portability, which simply means this. The person that survives can borrow or port over the estate tax exemption from their deceased spouse. Now in today's day and age at 13.6 million, that's combined, that's a lot of money. Right. But in a few years when it goes back to 5 million each, okay, now we're talking $10 million. And you know how the, the pendulum always swings. And so with changes in Congress in Washington, that 5 million per person, that can easily come down. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that they were talking about bringing it back to a million dollars. So portability is a really effective tool that gives you the ability to shelter more in taxes, but it gives you more flexibility than the, than the prior laws. Mm -hmm. So if your trust is older than 2010, you absolutely want to get that reviewed and really amended or edited immediately. What's interesting though, is you can keep the same name on the trust that you originally had. So you don't have, you know, the Leinberger Family Trust, you don't have to change the name. It's just now uh, edited or amended as of the, the, the current date. Perfect. So trust stays the same. You don't have to retitle your assets or retitle your accounts, but the language of the trust gets amended to be current with current law. Great, that's fantastic. And yeah. so now, now you've got your will and trust updated. It's newer than 2010. How often should you review this? Uh, I mean, on an annual basis would be nice. Um, what we like to do is we like to uh, review beneficiaries across all accounts every year. Um, I think you could probably get away with every three to five years reviewing the trust. Again, it's why you want to work with a good team of professionals because when there are major changes to the law, they should be making you aware. Um, I think you'd be okay about every three years to put your eyes on it. Great. Yeah. And then the typical cost on something like this? That's a great question. It really depends on the complexity. So if you were to get a trust created from scratch, you know, two to five thousand dollars, kind of a ballpark. Again, a very complex situation could be significantly more expensive. Um, but if your situation is not overly complex, you don't need to overpay for this. There's plenty of great estate planners out there um, that that do a good job in that range. Um, unfortunately, when you go to get your trust amended mm -hmm. or edited, uh, oftentimes if the estate planner who wrote the initial document, if they're retired or in some cases dead, and you're having to go to a new estate planner, they're gonna charge you, they're gonna wanna set the trust up from scratch, because uh, they don't really wanna sign off on someone else's work. And that makes sense. Yeah, Yeah. so you're unfortunate, we get that question a lot. Why am I having to pay for a whole new, again, the trust state, the, the name stays the same, it's just the language gets updated per current law. As you can see, estate planning can get rather complex very quickly. So we hope you enjoyed some of these nuances and nuggets about good estate planning. But if you're looking for more, if you wanna partner with a team to help you navigate this season of your life, feel free to reach out to my firm. My team and I look forward to getting to know you and determining how we can help you best navigate this season of your life. So if you like this content, be sure to like, subscribe, continue to watch our videos, and leave a comment below. We'll see you on the next one.